throughout the ages, there have been great empires and civilizations that have risen up, their creators ruling nations, regions, and continents for hundreds, even thousands of years. Some of the great legacies and accomplishments of these empires may be lost in the mists of time, but from what they have left behind in rock and ruin, we can trace remarkable stories. In this episode of Empire Builders, we explore the historic legacy of three of Europe's greatest powers, the French, Russian, and Austrian Habsburg empires, whose royal palaces, cathedrals, and other great buildings of the 16th to 20th centuries are some of the world's most remarkable and spectacular cultural monuments. We have to remember that Habsburg dynasty is probably the most successful European dynasty. Um, it's there for about 500 years or more. It easily outstretches the French and equivalent Russian dynasties. It's probably really not a very sensible thing to uh, work out a league table of the great cultures or great civilizations and the impact they've had on history, but were one to do that foolish exercise, certainly France would be up there, no question of a doubt. The history of you know, Imperial Russia teaches us both about the success of monarchies, but also about the way in which monarchies fail. The Russian monarchy was sowing the seeds of its own destruction. Europe between the 16th to 20th centuries was carved up into great competing empires, amongst the most powerful of which were the empires of France, the Austrian Habsburgs, and by far the biggest of them all, Russia. In this episode, we're traveling back in time to feature the remarkable and compelling stories of 10 of these great empires' most famous buildings. Our story starts in the mid-16th century in Moscow, Russia. Located on Red Square, just outside the Kremlin, St. Basil's Cathedral, with its spectacularly colorful domes, is one of Russia's most iconic buildings. St. Basil's was built in the mid-16th century by Ivan IV, otherwise known as Ivan the Terrible, just after he proclaimed himself the first Tsar of all the Russias, a title adopted by all his successors until the Russian Revolution in 1917. This cathedral was erected by the order of Ivan the Terrible in 1552 until the beginning of 17th century. It was the highest building in Russia. A bird's eye view gives the best idea of the cathedral's unique design. Surrounding the highest central spire are the remarkably colorful domes of four chapels at the cardinal points, north, east, south and west, with other smaller dome chapels in between. Inside the cathedral, a maze of colorful corridors connect the various chapels, of which perhaps the most important was built in the honor of a holy man, Basil the Blessed, after whom the entire St. Basil's Cathedral is now named. Here they could see the sanctuary. Inside it are remains of uh, St. Basil. St. Basil had the gift of visionary. Ivan the Terrible was a little bit afraid from St. Basil because everything that he said was truth and even he could say to Ivan the Terrible that he is rather cruel and he should make maybe another policy and so on. Apart from Basil the Blessed, nobody else would have dared to stand up to Ivan the Terrible. He routinely ordered the torture and slaughter of his enemies, and it's believed he killed even his own beloved son in a fit of rage. Ivan is clearly very tough indeed. He's absolutely ruthless. 
and we can get a sense of, of Ivan, I think, if we think that during the 1930s and 1940s, Joseph Stalin looks back to Ivan as a role model. Legend even has it that Ivan was so determined that St. Basil's Cathedral should be an unrivaled symbol of his greatness that he had its architects blinded so that they couldn't go on to build anything to surpass it. In truth, the architects are thought to have lived on and later built various other buildings in Moscow. It's certainly true, however, that none of them were as beautiful as St. Basil's. Elsewhere in Europe, France was about to enter a golden age, with the coming to power in the mid-17th century of Louis XIV, the so-called Sun King. As a boy, Louis had loved the trips he'd made with his father to a small royal hunting lodge at Versailles, just outside Paris. And so, once he became king, this was where he chose to build a magnificent new country home. Initially, Louis XIV simply expanded the original hunting lodge by adding a couple of wings at the front and some formal gardens at the back. In the 1670s, however, Louis XIV decided to expand Versailles once again, this time on a truly massive scale. By 1682, the vast new palace was finally completed and was now worthy of becoming his principal home. Located just over 10 miles outside Paris, the extraordinarily grand Palace of Versailles became not only Louis XIV's principal home from 1682 onwards, but also the seat of the French government. It's interesting to reflect why he should have wanted to build a palace outside at, uh, of uh, Paris. He had a perfectly serviceable, in fact, a rather brilliant palace in uh, Paris, which was the Louvre. But Louis XIV doesn't seem to have felt very comfortable in Paris. So putting himself at a distance from uh, the people of Paris, who have a reputation, obviously, for being turbulent and later revolutionary, was definitely one possible uh, reason. But I think also he just liked, you know, he, he liked the, the, the model. He liked to be uh, himself the center of attention, the center of a world that he had constructed, really. Remarkably, the palace is said to have over 2,000 rooms. Of all the rooms, the largest and most spectacular is the palace's dazzling main reception room, the Grand Gallery, otherwise known as the Hall of Mirrors. Astonishingly, it's 240 feet long. Louis XIV was very proud of his mirrors because there is 357 mirrors, and it was very difficult to make so big uh, mirrors at that time. When they arrived here, the visitor had to be very impressed by the power and the money, the richness of the King Louis XIV and the French people. Uh, 300 <laughs> years after, it's always a symbol of France, Versailles. So Louis XIV succeeded with his dream of Versailles. Right at the heart of the palace, beyond room after room of grand state apartments used for receptions and official occasions, were Louis XIV's so-called private apartments centered around the royal bedchamber. Remarkably to modern eyes, almost all aspects of Louis XIV's life took place as a kind of public ritual, and even his bedroom was usually crowded with courtiers. The most distinguished or favored of them would even be invited as a great honor to participate in the coucher ceremony, which involved helping the king undress before he went to bed. Here you have a balustrade, and it's very important. It is a symbolic uh, separation between the temporal and spiritual area. As the king was considered as God on earth, so only few people could enter uh, and cross this uh, balustrade, that is to say the people the king wanted to honor for the coucher. It, it is what we call etiquette. Nowadays, it's very funny to understand, but at that time, it was very important. 
On September the 1st, 1715, Louis XIV died here in his bedroom, surrounded by his courtiers. On his deathbed, his last words to his successor as king were apparently, I loved wars and buildings too much. Do not copy me. His reign, however, would come to be seen as a golden age, and later rulers, not just in France, but all across Europe, would try to copy the legacy of the so-called Sun King. One of the things which is very evident in the, from the late 17th and for the rest of the 18th century is any monarch worth their salt, any monarch wanting to sort of cut the mustard and international power politics wants a Versailles. So Versailles became a model which uh, was much admired, but also was much imitated, much copied. In particular, a series of spectacular palaces were built at this time in Russia's magnificent new capital, St. Petersburg, which by the mid 18th century was becoming one of Europe's grandest cities. The vast royal palaces in the city of St. Petersburg itself were only a part of it, however. Other spectacular palaces were also built for the Russian imperial family's pleasure in the surrounding countryside. Located 20 miles or so out of St. Petersburg, the exquisite Catherine Palace, as we see it today, was built in the 1750s by Peter the Great's daughter, Empress Elizabeth I, for use as her summer residence. Designed by a renowned French-born architect of Italian descent, Bartolomeo Rastrelli, a stupendous amount of money was spent building the palace in fashionable and exuberant late Baroque Rococo style. With money no object, the vast new palace, although over a thousand feet long, was completed in just four years. Elizabeth spends more than six and a half million rubles of the Russian state budget on this palace. And, and this is a stupendous um, amount of money. Empress Elizabeth and her successors are autocratic monarchs. There are no checks on their power. So how Elizabeth and her successors want to spend the state's budget is essentially a matter for the monarch. Inside the palace, too, no expense was spared by Elizabeth I to ensure the sumptuous interiors were some of the most splendid rooms in Europe. And here we come, in fact, in one of the most famous rooms in the world. That's Ember Room, because nowhere else you would see the room completely decorated with amber. Amber is a kind of fossilized tree resin valued for centuries as a precious gemstone. Remarkably, as much as six tons of amber is said to have been used to decorate this unique room, which Empress Elizabeth loved showing off to her guests. The best moment was sunset, when really sun was coming in, reflecting in the amber, and the whole air was colored with this warm orange color. And so that was like a rainbow, just the orange light in it. Miracle. To decorate many of the other rooms in the palace, huge amounts of gold was used. In fact, it is known from the reports of the time that they spent 300 kilograms of real gold on decorating the palace. You are completely blinded, more or less, by gold. You are blinded by Russia's magnificence and power and richness and wealth. The biggest room in the palace is the enormous Great Hall, which occupies the entire width of the palace and is over 150 feet long. Empress Elizabeth regularly hosted two extremely lavish grand balls every week here, with up to a thousand guests invited. The ostentatiously expensive outfits that she wore at these parties were legendary. Just imagine, when she died, they discovered something like 15,000 dresses in her wardrobe, an immense amount. 
thousands of shoes, thousands of stockings, and in fact she was using the dress only once for an important occasion. Never again, just once, a lie. She was really like an ultimate pop diva. She was Madonna of the 18th century. In general, Russia's imperial rulers were shockingly extravagant, but perhaps no more so than the French monarchy at their dazzling palace of Versailles, or other great European royal dynasties, such as the Habsburgs. In the mid-18th century, the Habsburg Empire, centered on its resplendent capital of Vienna, was enjoying a flourishing era of high culture and fabulous prosperity. At the height of this golden age, the Habsburg throne was inherited in 1740 by a young and ambitious empress, Maria Theresa, who almost immediately set about building one of Europe's most grandiose and magnificent palaces in the countryside outside Vienna. Empress Maria Theresa's initial plans for building Schönbrunn Palace were extraordinarily ambitious. Initially, it was intended it would surpass even the Palace of Versailles. And it was thought of as a kind of super Versailles. This should absolutely outstretch Versailles in terms of the, um, the grandeur, the magnificence of it, and the gardens, the park, etc. But when they got down to building it, they found that really wasn't practical and um, so it's, it's built on a rather more modest scale. Even so, with 1,400 rooms, Schönbrunn is on a huge scale compared to almost all other palaces apart from Versailles and is said to have required more than 1,000 servants to maintain. The largest and most splendid room of all is the Great Gallery, which was used for imperial receptions, banquets and balls. It's one of the most impressive Rococo-style hall in European architecture. It's the center of representation of the Maria Theresian epoch. The ceiling is uh, filled with three fresco works, and the topic of the paintings is the prosperity and the peace of the Habsburg monarchy. In addition to its sumptuous interior decoration, Schönbrunn Palace was renowned amongst all the royal courts of Europe for its rich cultural life. At the invitation of the Empress, it was here at Schönbrunn that the six-year-old child genius Mozart launched his musical career, performing for the royal family. Among those present at Mozart's concert, was Maria Theresa's daughter, Maria Antonia, seen here aged 12. A remarkable meeting of historical superstars, since a few years later, once married to the French King Louis XVI, she would become famous all over Europe as Marie Antoinette. In France by the late 18th century, however, revolution was in the air. The self-indulgent and highly extravagant lifestyle of King Louis XVI's court at Versailles made the royal family dangerously unpopular, especially his famously spendthrift new wife, Marie Antoinette. Of course, the behavior of the French court wasn't that different to the luxurious life enjoyed by all European royal families over previous centuries. But by the end of the 18th century in France, public expectations had changed. There's a growing intellectual movement uh, linked to the Enlightenment, much more rational, much more critical uh, view of the way in which society and politics is organized. And the sort of criticism that the king and queen are getting definitely reflects a change of perception, if you like, uh, of what's going on as much as a change of what is actually going on. 
Isolated out here in tranquil Versailles from the rebellious public mood in Paris, it was Louis XVI's misjudged attempt to raise more money by introducing new taxes that finally sparked a full-scale uprising in 1789, the French Revolution. Initially, the royal family lived fairly easily in Paris under house arrest, but by 1793, once the revolutionary mood had hardened, Louis XVI was executed, and Marie Antoinette was imprisoned awaiting trial in the revolutionary's most fearsome prison of all. Located beside the River Seine in the center of Paris, the Conciergerie had originally been the main royal palace of the medieval kings of France before being turned into a revolutionary prison. Apart from Marie Antoinette, thousands of other political prisoners were incarcerated here while awaiting trial before the revolutionary tribunal. In 1793, when she's there, it's sort of extraordinary sort of human zoo of uh, suffering and uh, uh, extremes, really, because you've got very, very grim conditions for people, uh, psychological mood uh, of just, you know, rock bottom morale, you know, people are expecting to uh, not to survive, essentially. Today, one of the rooms in the conciergerie commemorates those who were imprisoned here during the so-called Reign of Terror from 1793 to 1795. In these walls, you have the name of the more 4,000 people who have been judged by the Revolutionary Court. In black are inscribed the names of people who have been condemned to prison or released. And in red, the names of people who had been sentenced to death. Surprisingly, perhaps, a significant proportion of those who were imprisoned in the conciergerie were women. So we are now in the women's courtyard of the conciergerie. This place hasn't much changed the, since the end of uh, the 18th century. And at night, women used to sleep in their cells, but during the day, they came here gathering, walking, talking, washing their clothes, um, and eating, of course. On the first floor, wealthy women were kept because the cells were bigger, while on the ground floor, there were the poor women, except for Marie Antoinette. You can see the window of her last cell there. 20 years or so after her death, during a brief period when the French monarchy was temporarily restored, her brother-in-law, Louis XVIII, transformed the cell into a chapel in her memory. Behind me, there was her bed, and you can see on the walls that all is dark, all is very sad. You have some silver tears on the walls, and her initials, M and A, to remember that she sacrificed herself for uh, the French nation. After more than two months in prison, on the 14th of October, 1793, Marie Antoinette was taken for trial before the Revolutionary Court. Found guilty of treason, Marie Antoinette was sentenced to death and taken from the court in an open cart through Paris amidst jeering crowds to be executed in the Place de la Concorde, then known as the Place de la Revolution. Apart from Marie Antoinette, around 17,000 people are believed to have been executed during the French Revolution's reign of terror, and another 20,000 or so are thought to have either died in prison or been killed without trial. Alongside the gruesome bloodletting, however, there was also a gentler cultural revolution. In August 1793, a small public museum displaying paintings confiscated by the revolutionaries from the Royal Art Collection was opened in Paris. Today, it's the world's largest and perhaps most famous museum.
Located in the heart of Paris, the extremely grand Louvre Palace was originally the French monarchy's main residence during much of the 16th and 17th centuries. Once it was appropriated during the French Revolution for use as a museum, the number of artworks on display was initially just 700 or so. The museum's collections soon expanded dramatically, however, following a coup d'etat in 1799, led by the French Revolution's greatest military leader, Napoleon Bonaparte. Napoleon is a fantastic self-propagandist, and quite early on, he sees the potential of the Louvre to add to his glory. As the result of a succession of military triumphs abroad, which bought him huge popularity and the title of consul or dictator for life, Napoleon began filling up the Louvre with numerous world-famous artworks that he'd seized as the spoils of war from Egypt, Italy and elsewhere. It was at this time that the new director of the museum, a man called Vivant de Nantes, who was also a consummate courtier, uh, told Napoleon, wouldn't it be a good idea if we named this museum after you, sir? And of course, uh, Napoleon said, good idea. Uh, so at that point in 1803, the museum, this Musée Central des Arts, Central Museum of Arts, became known as the Musée Napoléon, the Napoleon Museum. By the following year, Napoleon had decided that the title of consul or dictator for life was no longer grand enough to match his exalted status. And so in December 1804, he had himself crowned emperor of the French. On hand to record Napoleon's coronation was France's most famous painter of the era, Jacques-Louis David. Napoleon loved this picture, uh, famously said, oh, look at this picture, you walk in this picture, it's fantastic. And it is incredible, you can see all of the individual faces. David famously adds Napoleon's mother. Napoleon's mother wasn't there, she was with his brother, Lucien. And it's almost like Napoleon has painted his mother in so he can say, look at me, Ma. <laughs> After Napoleon's coronation as emperor, more military victories followed which were celebrated by the building of the Arc de Triomphe and other great triumphal arches across Paris. But then, Napoleon made a huge mistake. In June 1812, his massive army, numbering over half a million men, attacked Russia. Uh, Napoleon is an utterly ambitious ruler. He believes that he's there to spread French revolutionary zeal as far as he possibly can. And in particular, you know, Central and Eastern Europe appear to be the most backward, benighted parts of the continent. These are the parts of the continent that, that need French virtue imposing upon them. Initially, things looked like going well for Napoleon. His troops won a series of battles against the Russians, and by September, Napoleon was able to lead his army into Moscow and set up his headquarters in the Kremlin. But the onset of the ferociously cold Russian winter changed everything, and by October, Napoleon's great army was forced into ignominious retreat back towards France. Napoleon's army is destroyed as it makes its way west from Moscow during the winter. The defeat of Napoleon was of immense significance for the Russian state. Russia had turfed out an invader which had got almost to the very heart of its state. In Moscow, nearby the Kremlin, to fulfill a promise that Tsar Alexander I had made on Christmas Day, 1812, a great new cathedral was commissioned to give thanks to the Russian army and God for saving the nation from Napoleon. This was the original plan for the cathedral, but when Tsar Alexander died in 1825, the new Tsar, Nicholas I, so disliked its neoclassical style that he overturned the decision. Instead, 
Nicholas I chose this design, with its five orthodox domes harmoniously arranged in a very Russian style, which he thought much more appropriate for a patriotic building project. The work of turning the new design into reality finally began in 1839 and took more than 40 years to complete. Built beside the Moscow River at nearly 350 feet high, the spectacular Cathedral of Christ the Saviour is still today said to be the tallest Orthodox Christian church in the world. Its size and grandeur is symbolic. For Russians, the defeat of Napoleon's invasion is second only in historic significance to the defeat of invasion by Nazi Germany during World War II. Now we're in the corridor of uh, military glory in the Cathedral of Christ the Saviour. Here you can see the memorial plaques which uh, telling uh, the story of the Patriotic War of 1812. Altogether, there are 155 memorial plaques uh, describing every single battle which was given to Napoleonic army during that Patriotic War. In first place, there's uh, the name of the city, village or place where the battle was held. Then who was in commander uh, in that battle and what regiments participating, who were killed, wounded and awarded after the battle. The cathedral built in the soldiers' honor is magnificent, but surprisingly, it isn't the original one. It's a replica completed in the year 2000. After the revolution of 1917, all religions were prohibited by the government of the Soviet Union. And they started with Moscow churches. They demolished them with explosions. And our church, the Cathedral of Christ the Savior, was also exploded in December of 1931. Remarkably, on the site of the demolished cathedral, Stalin intended to construct what would then have been the world's tallest building. The hundred-story high palace of the Soviets was planned to rise to over 1,300 feet, plus a huge 300-foot statue of Lenin at the top. Building work did in fact start with the laying of foundations but the extraordinary project had to be stopped when Germany invaded Russia in the Second World War. Half a century later, however, the collapse of the Soviet Union opened up new possibilities in the 1990s. In the end of the Soviet power, people decided to reconstruct their memory, traditions and history. Fortunately, very many pictures and documents were found about the cathedral. And during five year period, everything was uh, rebuilt again. The church was consecrated to the name of Christ the Savior in the year 2000. To rebuild the cathedral, the cost is estimated as uh, 800 million US dollars. One of the many curiosities of the Cathedral of Christ the Savior is that the construction of the original cathedral in the 19th century was on such a grand scale that although it was built to celebrate the famous victory over Napoleon in 1812, it was still being built in the 1850s, by which time Russia was being disastrously defeated in the Crimean War by an alliance of the Ottoman Empire, Britain and France. The main reason for this defeat was that by the mid-19th century, other European nations were modernizing much faster than Russia, which made a big difference, not just on the battlefield, but also back at home. In Paris, for example, this modernizing drive was demonstrated during the 1850s and 60s by the demolition of entire districts of old narrow streets in the city center, which were replaced with the grand, wide boulevards that give Paris its distinctive appearance today. Elsewhere, the Habsburg Empire's ancient imperial capital, Vienna, was also completely redeveloped at this time. 
Remarkably, right up until the 1850s, Vienna's city centre was unchanged since medieval times, enclosed by massive city walls and surrounded by an ancient moat that had been filled in to create parkland. A new, modern city was starting to grow up around it, but completely cut off from the maroon city centre. Redesign was crucial if Vienna was to enter the modern age. So in 1857, the Habsburg Emperor, Franz Joseph, ordered the demolition of the old city walls and the construction of a grand new circular boulevard in place of the old moat. To beautify the new inner ring road, a series of grand, opulent buildings were constructed all along it from the 1860s onwards. Vienna, of course, was the home of the Waltz and the adopted home of Mozart. So for the Habsburgs, one of the most important of all the new buildings along the Ringstrasse was the one dedicated to the great musical art of opera. Uniquely among the Ring Road's major buildings, the Opera House was built in neo-Renaissance style with harmonious geometrical arches and columns. This particular architectural style was chosen since it was during the Renaissance that opera originated in 16th century Italy. What impresses me the most every time I walk into that opera is the symbolism everywhere. It's just uh, magnificent. For example, look here on the balustrade, you see the initials of Emperor Francis Joseph. Up there, there are the two reliefs, ballet and opera, things that are played here every day. And below them, you see the reliefs uh, of the architects, uh, both of them. And here, this is the private tea salon of Emperor uh, Francis Joseph. You can see all over his initials, for example, on the top above the mirror, FJ1. Here you can also see the two-headed eagle. The double-headed eagle was the coat of arms of uh, the Holy Roman Empire, uh, which existed until the year 1806. Two years before then, uh, the so-called Austrian Empire was established, and uh, the Habsburgs used that coat of arms again. Here, so we are now in the auditorium of uh, the opera. This is the box where the emperor was sitting when he attended. On the first day of the opera, when it was opened in May 1869, the whole nobility of uh, the Austro-Hungarian Empire gathered. On that opening evening, there was Mozart played. They decided to play uh, Don Giovanni. Despite the Habsburgs' musical traditions, however, Emperor Franz Joseph found opera boring and was quite often seen to fall asleep during a performance. To avoid the possibility on this gala occasion, perhaps, it's believed he slipped away early after Act One. Surprisingly, the Opera House itself was also unpopular amongst the general public as a work of architecture. People did not like it. The main reason was because of the street level of the Ringstrasse. It looked like a bit sunken. And all the other buildings, uh, if you look on the Ring Road, they have ramps where you uh, go up to the Palace of Politics, to the Palace of Culture, but to the Palace of Music, there is no ramp. The criticism from the Viennese, from the people here in the city, made uh, Eduard van der Nuel so sad that he actually committed suicide. Sigurdsburg uh, died a few weeks later uh, on a heart attack or tuberculosis. It's not 100% sure. Actually, maybe because of a broken heart, because he lost his life partner and architect friend.
just a couple of years before the Opera House was completed, the Habsburg army suffered a major defeat in battle in 1866 at the hands of the growing power of Prussia. One of the consequences of this was that Emperor Franz Joseph was forced to reconcile with the Habsburg Empire's restive province of Hungary. That is what is usually uh, referred to as the Compromise of 1867, where effectively we get the empire split in two. It becomes Austria-Hungary. There are some institutions in common, common foreign policy, common army, but Hungary really is, um, has a large amount of home rule after 1867. As part of the Compromise, Franz Joseph remained not only the Emperor of Austria, but also the King of Hungary. Nevertheless, the Hungarians were able to celebrate a substantial degree of autonomy in domestic affairs. To honor this momentous occasion in Hungary's history, an architectural competition was launched to design an appropriately magnificent new parliament building to be built in the capital, Budapest, beside the Danube. When there were plans to build this, the Hungarian prime minister, who was usually quite a thrifty person, basically said, no, we should spare no expense on this. We've got to produce a building which will impress both our friends and our enemies. Construction of Hungary's extraordinarily grand parliament building took nearly 20 years, from 1885 to 1904. Displaying an exceptionally harmonious mix of different architectural styles, the centerpiece of the beautifully proportioned building is a great Renaissance-style dome rising over 300 feet high. Most of the rest of the building, inspired by the British Parliament, is designed in Gothic style. At around 900 feet long, remarkably, at the time of its construction, this was the world's largest Parliament building. The inside of the vast Parliament building is as grand and magnificent as the outside, and was decorated by many of Hungary's foremost artists and craftsmen of the era. More than 40 kilograms of gold was used in order to lavishly gild the building's interior. Of all the nearly 700 rooms in the Parliament building, the most important, of course, are the council chambers used by Hungary's members of Parliament. On very rare special occasions, however, Parliament has met not in the council chambers, but in the Parliament building's architectural highlight and structural centerpiece, the Great Dome Hall. We are in the heart of the Hungarian Parliament, under the dome. The dome is supported by 16 pillars, each of them showing a Hungarian king. In the very middle of the dome, you can see the Hungarian Holy Crown, which is an 800 years old object and by that, it is one of the oldest crowns in Europe. It was brought here in the year 2000 to reinforce Hungarian legal traditions. The Holy Crown has great symbolic significance for Hungary, but the last time a king was actually crowned with it was in 1916, following Franz Joseph's death during World War I. As it turned out, Franz Joseph's successor as Habsburg Emperor and King of Hungary ruled for just two years until 1918, when the Austro-Hungarian Empire and their allies Germany finally lost World War I. The result of this crushing defeat was not only the abolition of the Habsburg monarchy, but also the total disintegration of the once great Habsburg Empire. As things transpired, World War I would also be a very significant factor in the demise of the Russian Tsars. The stage for many of the most dramatic events of the Russian Revolution in 1917 was the Tsar's vast royal palace at the heart of St. Petersburg. A 
Of all the Russian royal family's many palaces in and around St. Petersburg, the Winter Palace was perhaps the most opulent of them all. Dwarfing many of the greatest palaces in other European empires, the spectacular Baroque facade of the Winter Palace, decorated with grand imposing statues and embellished with the finest stucco work, is over 800 feet long. Inside the palace, on the upper floor, above an extraordinarily grand ceremonial staircase, there are more than 500 magnificent state rooms. Here, from the great throne room, the last of the Tsars, Nicholas II, who inherited the throne in 1894, ruled over the vast Russian Empire as the last of Europe's supreme monarchs with absolute powers. Throughout the first decade of Nicholas II's reign, however, there was growing unrest against his autocratic rule. And so, to try to avert full-scale revolution, he agreed to allow Russia's first elected national parliament to be set up. Its first meeting was held here in the Great Throne Room in April 1906, but Russia's first tentative experiment with democracy lasted just two months before Nicholas became exasperated with Parliament's independence and suspended it. The problem of Nicholas II as a personality was that he couldn't cope with the idea that people are elected and then they express people's opinion how to develop the country, how to solve this or that problem. He couldn't accept it. He was still the only ruler of the country. And that's why, 12 years later, full Russian revolution took place and destroyed it all completely and swept away all that country that existed before that. The catalyst for full-scale revolution was World War I. The deaths of millions of Russian soldiers in battle, combined with anger at Nicholas II's failure to accept democratic reforms, led to the mutiny of numerous army regiments in St. Petersburg in March 1917. Finally realizing his position was hopeless, Nicholas II was forced to abdicate the throne and a new provisional government stepped in, comprised of liberals and moderate socialists. Unwisely, as it turned out, while the Tsar was placed under house arrest in another of his palaces, the provisional government used the Winter Palace as their headquarters. They were new democratic power. There was a chance to, to move somewhere, to be associated with something different. No, they stayed in the palace, in the reception room of the emperors. And that's why, as you can imagine, for people's imagination, when October Revolution took place, there was no difference even in the image between imperial power and provisional government. They were all in the imperial palace. And that's why taking the palace was like destroying the old power. The successful storming of the Winter Palace during the Communist October Revolution is one of the most famous and dramatic events in history. Yet, surprisingly, there was almost no resistance to the attack, or bloodshed. As the Bolsheviks, under their charismatic leader Lenin, had already won the battle for the hearts and minds of a large proportion of the Russian people, they were able to persuade the provisional government's forces in St. Petersburg to surrender almost without a shot being fired. And since even the Winter Palace itself was now defended by just a few dozen military cadets, the game was up for the cabinet ministers of the provisional government holed up inside. And so when the Bolsheviks staged their rebellion on October the 25th, the Red Guards were able to storm into the Winter Palace and arrest the remaining ministers of the provisional government without any resistance at all. Today, in one of the small rooms, which had originally been one of Tsar Nicholas II's private apartments, a memorial plaque records the historic events that took place here. Soldiers and sailors came into this room with their representative of new power with them, and they told 
the ministers of the provisional government, they are arrested. And then sounded probably such a fantastic sentence, your time is over. And in fact, it is really such a paradox or irony of fate. The small room was planned for family dinners of Nicholas and Alexandra. And suddenly, it opened a new chapter in the history of mankind. The ministers of the provisional government were imprisoned in the fortress across the river. But worse was in store for the deposed Tsar and his family. Half a year later, on July the 17th, 1918, the former Tsar Nicholas II, now referred to simply as Mr. Romanov, was executed, along with his wife and all his children. The execution of the former Tsar of Russia and his family was not only a pivotal moment in Russian history, ushering in 70 years of communist rule, it was also the final nail in the coffin for the autocratic imperial dynasties whose great empires had once held sway over a vast proportion of Europe. Napoleon's French Empire, the Austrian Habsburg Empire, and now the Russian Tsars were all consigned to history. And the age of empire was over.